Hey Dietrich Labs, Sam here. So in this video I'm going to show you how to derive the Friedman equations from the Einstein field equations. Now anytime we have to plug a metric on SOTS into the Einstein field equations it, it gets long and tedious because that's just the complicated and long nature of the Einstein field equations. I've done two other videos where I um, do that now at this point. I plan on doing more because it's kind of fun and really interesting even if it gets a bit long. Now uh, the derivation of the Friedman equations from the Einstein field equations, just the math alone in my case took like 10 pages. So to try and help keep you from getting lost while you're watching the video, uh, what I'm going to do is um, give you a word explanation of the process first. So that then you know where the thing is going, you know what to expect, you know where we are. It'll help keep you from getting lost. And then I'll go into the details of the math itself. Okay, so the Friedman equations... Uh, ultimately are differential equations for the scale factor describing cosmological expansion. So we're using general relativity to study cosmology. Now, three of the most basic observations in cosmology are isotropy, homogeneity, and cosmological expansion. One would expect this expansion to satisfy the Einstein field equations. Expansion would cause time, dependent in the, time dependence in the metric additional if there already is time dependence, but ultimately there should be some time dependence uh, in the metric specifically describing cosmological expansion. And general relativity doesn't just disappear uh, because the universe is expanding, so one would expect the uh, time dependence specifically from expansion to not stop the metric from solving the Einstein field equations. So then to explore what sort of Cosmolog cosmological expansion uh, is, is allowed by the theory, we need to figure out what sort of cosmological expansion uh, solves the Einstein field equations. Now, to explore what sort of cosmological expansion the EFE allows, we must devise metric ansatzes that include uniform scale expansion and are homogeneous and isotropic. We can then insert these ansatzes into the Einstein field equations to explore cosmological expansion. It turns out that there are only three completely homogeneous and isotropic geometries to consider. Flat space, of course, spherically curved space, and hyperbolically curved space, where the latter two are a bit less obvious. The four-dimensional space-time metrics that feature these spatial geometries uh, for their pure space hypersurfaces um, are diagonal, which makes things much easier. Additional uniform scale expansion of the pure space hypersurface can be included in the metric by multiplying each of the three pure space components on the diagonal by a single time-dependent scale factor. One is then free to insert these metrics into the Einstein field equations to obtain constraints on the scale factors in the form of differential equations. However, we don't actually need to insert three different metrics into the Einstein field equations. It turns out that a clever change of coordinates allows all three metrics to be combined into one, where the spatial geometry is selected by picking the value of this new parameter that we've introduced. Uh, once this coordinate change has been performed, we obtain the standard friedman lemaitre robertson walker metric, or FLRW metric. It is then finally time to actually insert the metric on sides into the Einstein field equations. When this is done, they collapse down to the Friedman equations. So, as per the description I just gave, it is now time to perform the coordinate transformation on the metric. So, starting with the uncoordinate transformed metric, um, it's like this. Except this actually summarizes three, because there are three potential values for the sigma function. And... One, there's one for spherically curved space, one for flat, and one for hyperbolically curved space. This is standard spherical coordinate, so you probably are not surprised that the correspondence is uh, for, for the various different types of space. Spatial curvature is specifically that. Okay, so then uh, this can be 
uh, transformed such that we only have to insert one metric instead of three. Now, the coordinate transformation that does this is just a coordinate transformation on the radial coordinate. We're not messing with the time coordinate. We're not messing with the angles. It's purely a transformation on the radial coordinate. So, uh, <clears throat> first, the coordinate, the new radial coordinate we're transforming to, I'm going to call R, even though that's the name for the radial coordinate we're transforming from. So to reduce confusion, I'm first going to relabel the radial coordinate chi. So then we'll transform from chi to R, where R is the new radial coordinate and chi is the old one. So then now we have this. Okay, so then the line element we're dealing with is this. Now we're uh, just transforming the radial coordinate. Uh, so we need to transform this differential, and then we need to transform uh, th these functions there. <clears throat> okay, so the change of coordinates is as follows. R is set equal to this sigma function. So then dr squared equals this in terms of chi. Uh, so then you may ask, how is this going to merge into one? Well, we have to do the coordinate transformation for each case separately, and then we'll see how we can introduce a new parameter to, in a very nifty way, uh, combine it all into one. Okay, so let's take the spherical case first. For this case, r equals sine, theta, sine of chi, not theta, chi. That's the coordinate we're using here. Okay, so then dr squared equals cosine squared of chi d chi squared. Then solving for d chi squared gives us this, okay? So then this is important. The coefficient on this r squared we're going to take to be 1, and we're going to leave the minus sign in there. Okay, so then let's see. <clears throat> now let's do it for flat space. Um, and it, it should be straightforward, but there's actually a detail to make the introduction of that key new parameter apparent. So we have then uh, uh, d chi squared just equals dr squared, but we're going to write that dr squared in a funny way. We're going to write it dr squared over 1 minus 0 r squared. So then comparing this box to this one, we see we can just change between the two by changing the value of the coefficient from 1 to 0. So then what we're going to do is perform the coordinate transformation on for hyperbolic curvature and see if there's a similar form where we can just pick a coefficient of r to get that. So then for the hyperbolic case, we see that that does happen. r equals sine hyperbolic of chi. So then dr squared equals cosine hyperbolic squared of chi d chi squared. Okay, so then uh, we can write d chi squared, we can solve for it, and we get this. But then that's just like picking the coefficient, which was 1 here, to be minus 1. So then what we can do is we can write all three of them together like this, where k is 1 for spherically curved space, 0 for flat space, and minus 1 for hyperbolically curved space. So this is really, really a nifty way to do it. And then, of course, we have to remember that r, the new coordinate, equals sigma of chi. So then we can finally substitute that into the line element and get our uh, metric. So here is uh, the old line element, and that goes to this when we plug it in. So then we can read off the metric tensor and write it in matrix form, and here we go. We have the... Standard Friedman Lemaitre Robertson Walker metric. It's beautiful. Okay, so now we need to plug this into the Einstein field equations to get the Friedman equations for these scale factors. Uh, and the first step to doing that is to uh, evaluate the Christoffel symbols for this metric. I think there are 19 non zero ones. Um, I haven't actually counted recently, so I'm not totally sure. Uh, but basically, I'm going to put the calculation on the screen, and if you want to look at it in detail, you can pause the video. I'm only going to explain what I did for one case, and all the rest is basically the same. So the first thing I did was I plugged in the values for the live indices, and then I expanded out uh, the sum over the, the dummy index sigma, and ignored terms that were zero due to uh, non-zero components of this contravariant metric here, and that gave this, that left this. 
but then that's also zero and that's also zero, so it reduces to this. Now that is non-zero and that's non-zero, so I inserted the non-zero values and got this, took the derivative, wrote it uh, in dot notation, and got that. And I followed the same process for all these uh, all the others. This is the first set. You can pause it if you want to look at it. Okay. This is the rest of them. You can pause it if you want to look at it. At the actual solving, the actual algebra. If you want to just skip straight ahead uh, and see the answer, uh, this is a box that has all of them. All 19, I think. Well... Yeah, whatever. Uh, roughly 19. I think I've ca uh, I remember correctly. So that's all of them. So now the next step is to compute the Ricci curvature tensor. Now this is a bit more complicated. I use this table here to organize my expansion of the sums over dummy indices. And the reason why I do that is because it gets messy fast and it's easy to um, forget a term or add in an extra term accidentally. So just to keep things organized, I use this table to organize it. Basically what I do is I set the value, the, all the possible values of the dummy indices, and then I uh, look at each term, and I write that term with uh, that particular value for the dummy index, and because I'm doing all uh, values, I eventually get every term. Then I ignore the ones that are zero because of zero Christoffel symbols. Uh, and I just leave the terms that are non-zero, but I don't yet plug in the non-zero value. So I do one stage for expanding the sums over row dummy indi indices, and then one for the sigma dummy indices. Then finally, uh, I write out the answer in terms of the non-zero Christoffel symbols, and uh, the full answer after all the dummy indices, all the sums over them have been expanded out. Then I plug in the values, for those non-zero Christoffel symbols and simplify. So that's the result then for the first non-zero Ricci curvature tensor component. The second one, R11, the, the one we just did was R00, is here. This is the table for expanding the dummy index sums. And this is the inserting the non-zero values for the, the remaining Christoffel symbols and then simplifying to get this. So then the table for expanding the dummy index sums is here for the R22, the third non-zero component. Then inserting the values for the non-zero Christoffel symbols and simplifying is done here. You can pause it if you want to look at it. That's the answer. So then for the final non-zero one, we have this. Okay, so this is the table for expanding the dummy, uh, expanding the sums over the, over the dummy indices uh, for R33. Then you plug in the values for the non-zero Christoffel symbols like before, simplify, and after much painful effort, you eventually get that. Okay, so then to summarize, if you just want the answers to like check work you're doing or whatever, then you can look at this. All the other terms in the Ricci curvature tensor evaluate to zero pretty trivially. You can check that yourself. I'm not going to write all that out. I wrote out the, the less trivial ones that don't end up being zero. Okay, so uh, that is the Ricci curvature tensor. Next, we need to calculate the scalar curvature. Okay, so here we are with the scalar curvature. Due to the fact that these are both diagonal matrices, it simplifies to this immediately. We can plug in the values for those components and then simplify to get this beautiful result. Now, it turns out that the... Uh, uh, the first Friedman equation comes from the zero, zero component of the normal Einstein field equations, and then the uh, second Friedman equation comes from the zero, zero component of the trace inverted Einstein field equations. And because of that, we only need the zero, zero component of the Einstein tensor. So we write it out, plug in the values, simplify, and we get that. Now we've got one last thing to do before we can start actually writing out the Friedman equations, and that is to calculate the necessary components of the stress energy momentum tensor. We need the zero zero component of the covariant stress energy tensor and since we're going to deal with the trace inverted EFE we also need the trace of it. So we need the um, uh, mixed tensor form so with one upper index and one lower index so we can set the two indices equal and do the sum and get the trace that we need. So first uh, in 
the universe that uh, was originally imagined when this cosmological model was devised, it was totally homogeneous, totally isotropic, and filled with a totally uniform homogeneous isotropic fluid of constant density and pressure, hence totally uniform and homogeneous and isotropic. Uh, <clears throat> and it was also imagined to be not flowing around. So the only time dependence in the metric would just be the cosmological expansion. And as a result, the proper velocity is zero, and the stress-energy-momentum tensor is just the perfect fluid stress-energy tensor. So the uh, FLRW metric is technically a perfect fluid solution, but it's a particularly simple perfect fluid solution because the proper velocity is that for the not moving case, meaning not flowing around. It's this value um, because that's what uh, corresponds to a perfect fluid that's not flowing around. And that's important because, as you can see, the perfect fluid stress energy tensor depends on the proper velocity. Now we also need to remember uh, the metric. <clears throat> this is the contravariant metric because the perfect fluid stress energy tensor also depends on the metric and we need to use the metric that's natural in the space, which is the FLRW metric. So using that natural metric to raise and lower indices, we get the covariant form from the standard perfect fluid stress energy tensor, which is usually written in the contravariant way like that. And we also get the mixed tensor form there. So now we can read off the components that we want according to the value of the metric and the value of the proper velocity. So we needed the T00, which is just rho. You can look at this in the context of uh, that and uh, this value for G mu nu. And uh, ultimately, this particular component just reduces down to the uh, density just for 0, 0. It's just the, the plain old density. We have rho plus P times what ends up being 1 for the 0, 0 component minus P times what ends up being 1 for the 0, 0 component of the metric there. Right, so then those two cancel and you just are left with the density rho. Now if you do a similar uh, uh, analysis, then you get this for the full uh, mixed stress energy momentum tensor for this particular value of the proper velocity and metric. So then the trace works out to be that. So these are the values, the stress energy momentum tensor values we need. Okay, so then uh, we can actually get the Friedman equations now. Now by plugging into the Einstein field equations using the sign convention that is normally used for these, uh, for this particular problem. And I realize that I need another n there, sorry. Uh, I missed the second n. But anyway, inserting the things into the EFE now with the sign convention that's usually used for this problem gives us the first Friedman equation there. Okay, so then putting the C's back in with dimensional arguments gives us the standard result that everyone is used to. So then now we need to trace invert the EFE. So starting again with the EFE, the normal EFE with the sign convention that's usually used for this problem. Okay, and then performing the trace inversion process, so we take the trace of both sides. See, uh, that was on screen, I think, yeah. Let's see. Yes, it was. Okay, so then we get this. Now we can do a little algebra. Uh, we uh, factor and divide, and then we multiply by that factor, and that gives us this. Subtracting the EFE then gives us this, which is the trace inverted EFE in this uh, sign convention. Okay, so then, now again, I forgot n's on all the Friedman's, the second n, sorry. Taking the zero, zero component gives us the second Friedman equation, which is that. Okay, so then putting the c's back in via dimensional analysis, that's the one that we get directly, and then putting the c's in, speeds of light in back with dimensional analysis gives us the standard result. So then we have the Friedman equations. There you go. That is how you go. That's how you first get the Friedman Lemaitre Robertson Walker metric, and then how you derive uh, the standard Friedman equations from the Einstein field equations by plugging it in. Dietrich out.